Thank you so much for joining us again today. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, as we come to study your word, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing on article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. Our author writes, We believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture continues to be John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And our kind of a subtopic under that heading is our third declaration of freedom, which is freedom from discouragement, no frustration. And that's found in Romans the 8th chapter, verses 18 through 30. And we've been focusing uh, the last couple of weeks or so on verse 28, which says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And we said that the promise of God working all things for good is not for everybody. It can be, but the conflict, the tension, is that not everybody loves God. And God will overrule and work through even the toughest tragedies and circumstances that we may encounter in, in, in our lives. There is no situation that God cannot work through. No human God cannot touch. No chain of authority he cannot reach. There's no doors that he cannot open. Uh, there is none that he cannot close. The things that God can do and will do are endless uh, in order to accomplish his purposes in the lives of those who love him and who has responded to his call. That's a great comfort, uh, a great assurance, assurance uh, to those who love God. God looks after the affairs of those who love him. That does not mean that God is not concerned about the people that don't love him. The amazing thing is that God has chosen to love us. He is always waiting with open arms to receive us. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, verse 37, Jesus laments over Jerusalem, uh, the city of God the people of God, who had rejected the love of God. He said in that verse, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I would have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. The Great love of Christ is shown in that verse in multiple ways. In the words, how often I would have, we see the great patience of God. Hear how personal that is. He personally would have saved them often. That says to me that Jesus sees my humanity. He, he sees my weaknesses. He knows that he would have to rescue me time and time again. He desired the salvation of Jerusalem, not their condemnation. And he desires that for us. Next in that verse, uh, in the words gather, we see his great desire 
to care for the care for and protect people in the word. He he says, How often I have longed to gather your children together. He he gives a, a the picture of a hen gathering her chicks under her wings to protect them. I've heard about hens protecting her chicks, but it dawned on me as I was reading this that I have never seen it. So, y'all know me. I went to my BFF, Google, to actually see it. And it was overwhelming to see how tenderly the hen deals with her chicks, how her wings become like a, a, a dome to provide shelter, and how she will use those same wings to attack a predator if necessary. It amazed me how at any given time her little chicks are, are never far from her, or and if one is lagging behind, how she tenderly brings it into the fold. And to think that at that that as the picture think of that as the picture given to us by Jesus, who longs to do that for us. Christ longs to gather us himself, often to himself, often. You might be saying, how can I tell? You might be asking how, how would I know? Every time we hear the gospel and sense a pull within our hearts to draw near to him, that's him reaching out to gather us unto himself. As moving as that picture is, the latter part of that verse says, but you were, you were not willing. They rejected him. They wouldn't let him. Any parent of an adult child of adult children remembers the teenage years. And if you don't have any adult children, you remember when you were a teenager. Those years are, I, I think, universally called the rebellious years. I, I've heard it said by uh, one comedian that the, those are the years years that you wish you could, uh, there was a place that you could put your teens and, and then just come back and get them when it's all over. A time when it, when if it were possible, we could just skip over and, and jump to the young adult stage. But it's during those times that you often long to gather them as a hen protects her chicks, but they're not willing. It doesn't mean that we don't love them. We do, but love cannot be forced on a person. God wants to work all things out for our good, but he can only do that if we choose to love him. Oh, how the father loves us, but we are not willing. If you recall uh, from our last week, our last study, we paused our study to take what I call the scenic route, to look at how much the Father loves us. So John 3.16, we looked at in the message version. It says, this is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need to be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. Last time, we did a summation of the previous verses before John 3.16. And today, we'll zoom in on some of the illustrations given by Jesus to Nicodemus. In verse 2, Nicodemus calls Jesus a teacher who has come from God based on the miracles he had done. So, so Jesus starts with that mindset 
to teach Nicodemus about salvation. Nicodemus wanted to know more about Jesus and the doctrines that he taught. He probably thought that since he too was a teacher, that uh, he was just talking to maybe uh, uh, on a lesser plane to one of his advanced peers. Uh, he, being a teacher of the Jews, wanted to have conversation with Jesus, the teacher from Galilee. Now, Nicodemus was deeply sincere in his quest for truth. Uh, coming to Jesus by night gave him a, a, a quiet, uninterrupted time. And you know, when you think about it, we could all learn a lesson from Nicodemus. To find a quiet, uninterrupted time in our day to meet with the master. So, who was this man called Nicodemus? First of all, he was a ruler of the Jews. Which means he was a senator or a member of the Sanhedrin which was the ruling body of the Jews of that day. He was also a Pharisee, which was a man of high moral character uh, with deep religious hunger, with a deep religious hunger, all the while with a profound spiritual blindness. He, he was the master of Israel, which means he held some official position of the highest rank. Also, he was either the, the leading officer or, or the leading teacher of Israel, and he was accepted as such by the people. Nicodemus apparently was wealthy because John tells us in the 19th chapter that he spent about 100 pounds on the abundance of spices used in Jesus' burial. Most of all, Nicodemus was searching. He wanted to know who Jesus was. He had been, he, he had been drawn to Jesus by the miracles, and, and he knew at least one thing. He knew that, that Jesus had to be from God. Nicodemus was compelled to find out who Jesus was. John 3 and 2 says, He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now note that that is a statement. It's not a question. And yet, he was really asking a question. Who are you? Note also that Jesus didn't discuss his credentials with Nicodemus. Jesus saw into his heart and, and, and that he was honestly searching. So Jesus went right to the heart of the matter and answered the question that was not verbally asked. John 3 and 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's a strong statement. Can you imagine how Nicodemus must have felt hearing that? He was a teacher of the law, probably thinking he had an automatic entry into God's kingdom. He came from an important aristocratic family in Jerusalem and was an authority on scripture. To hear that none of that matter as it relates in, to the entry into the kingdom of God had to have been mind-boggling for him. Can you imagine to have spent your life thinking that who you were who your family was, what your status was, thinking that all that meant that you were automatically in, that, that you were in the kingdom of God just because of who you were or who your family was 
or, or what your your status in society was. And now to be told by the man you believe was sent from God that the only way to get in is to be born again, which sounds like a hopeless situation. To those that were uh, uh, fans of, of this old sitcom, everybody remember different strokes. When, when Jesus said that he must be born again, that would have been what uh, 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 that would have been a, a, a what you talking about with this moment. You know how, how Arnold used to say that to, to Willis, like, what you talking about, Willis? Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That means that being born again is a necessity. It's essential. It's the only way. <clears throat> that word, again, has three different meanings in the Greek. It means from the first, which is from the beginning, or completely and fully. It, it, it means again, a second time, a repeated act. And it means from above, from the top, which means from God. So when Jesus said that a man or a woman must be born again, he was saying, he must be born completely and fully, a complete and full change. He must be born all over again in the sense of a second time. And he must be born from above, from God. It's not something that you can do yourself. It has to be from God. It's, it, it's all about God. Jesus said, Except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He, he will not see it. He will not enter the kingdom of God. It, 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 it's an absolute essential that a person be born again to enter the kingdom of God. I, I should point out here that in the Bible, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are interchanged. So some what sometimes you may see the kingdom of God, sometimes you may see the kingdom of heaven, but it's the same thing. It, it evidently means the same as the kingdom of God, eternal life, salvation. They all belong to the very same concept. So eternity and salvation, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, all of them are interchangeable. And so Nicodemus was puzzled by the words born again and asked Jesus a question. He says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? I think I can scream the answer to that question. On behalf of every woman, every female who has ever given birth to a baby. The answer is no to the capital N and to the capital O. No, you cannot enter a second time into your mother's womb to be born again. And thank God you can't. Birthing a baby is hard enough. Clearly, Nicodemus was thinking physical. And I might add a bit on the crazy side, considering his credentials. To this day, when my boys, and now I can include my grandsons along with it, <clears throat> whenever they make an obvious statement that makes no sense, my pet phrase is to call them a ding-dong. But, but Jesus... Being the master teacher does not call Nicodemus out like that, at least not right now. Instead, Jesus is patient with him. He is long-suffering with him. 2 Peter 3 and 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us 
not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We too can learn the skill of patience that, that Jesus exhibited here. If I mean, when you think about it, if God does not give understanding, no amount of badgering a person will make it happen. It, it just... It just will not come. If God does not give it, it will not come. So Jesus continued to further explain the new birth by using something else that Nicodemus could should be familiar with. To find out what it was, you got to come back. Join us next week as we enjoy the amazing view on our scenic route. Until then, take care, be safe, and oh yeah, don't forget to click the subscribe button below. The little button below that says subscribe, go right now, click it. And then you will be notified when a new lesson is available. And please, please, please feel free to leave a comment. In this uh, era of COVID-19 and and not seeing people, it's encouraging. It encourages me to read your comments. So feel free to leave a comment. Until next time, be blessed and may the grace of our Lord and Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. See you next time.